Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 97. How often have you thought about your developer experience? How do you improve your workflow, find documentation, and simplify code formatting? This week on the show, Adam Johnson is here to talk about his new book, Boost Your Django DX. Adam provides advice on improving your experience, developing specifically inside Django and within Python. We discuss tools to simplify code formatting and linting, and Adam shares a couple of his own Django tools designed to simplify development and keep your projects updated. He also covers documentation resources for finding answers quickly. This episode is brought to you by Scout APM. Spend less time debugging and more time building with Scout APM. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Adam. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Hi, Chris. You kind of reached out, and I was fascinated by all this work you've been up to, and I really like your book, the Django Developer Experience book. Boost Your Django DX. Oh, but, um, the DX. I'll take the title, The Django Developer Experience book. <laughs> it currently <laughs> is, in my mind. <laughs> so you are a member of the Django Project Technical Board, and maybe you can explain maybe the difference between, like the Python Software Foundation, there's also a Django Software Foundation, and then there's the Technical Board. What are the differences there? Sure. So the Software Foundation is, like Python's one, a nonprofit dedicated to keeping Django alive and spreading its use and teaching people, helping conferences out. And then uh, there's the Django Software Foundation Board. That's the people responsible for running the charity, and they're elected on a yearly basis. And then the technical board is on the side there, and we're a group of five people who have the kind of last say on technical matters. So we're basically contributors who've been working on Django for a while. And once in a while, not very often, there's an issue that's maybe a bit contentious and can't be settled just through the normal channels of finding a consensus on the mailing list. Okay. So we have the final vote Is there a version of something like PEPS, the Python Enhancement Protocol process that you guys use? Exactly. It's called DEPS, Django Enhancement Proposals. (laughs) All right. There you go. (laughs) How did you get involved with the technical board? It's been a bit of a journey. I started working with Django in 2012 and, and I've gone from one Django job to the next. And I started really contributing to the community from 2014, 2015 onwards. At some point, I was voted in to become a core member. That's what it was called at the time. That would have been the end of 2016. Okay. And that was just people who had commit access. There was quite a lot of people who were contributing and maybe had commit access. And since then, the process has been formalized a bit with DEP 10. That's another of those DEPs. Yeah, okay. (laughs) And that's when the technical board was founded as like, here's the people who have the voting rights we're elected on a on a major release cycle basis and so i've had the luck to be voted in for django two three and four now yeah i was thinking about it i started in python you know three four years ago and it was still django i think was it 111 it was like one of the big releases that kind of was a uh, right as django 2 started which i was very excited about because i, I like kind of the direction things were headed but it seems like there's quite the velocity lately with Django yeah and um, part of that part of that is the change in the release process that happened just as at the end of 111 um, where the decision was to move to have like a schedule for when deprecations happen hmm. so each version of Django is going through a point zero, point one, point two 0.1 0.2 release and these are, these are a bit more like uh, feature releases, really. But 
if your code works on Django 2.0 without deprecation warnings, it will work on Django 3.0 is the guarantee. Okay. Um, maybe we'll have new deprecation warnings. But Yeah, and the most recent l- release of 4.0, when did that come out? That was in December. Okay, yeah. so it just came out. And what, what would be like a, a headline feature? Oh, well, there's a few. There's a functional unique indexes, which is, sounds quite neat niche, but that allows you to do things like all my users in the database must have unique email address after applying lowercase. Oh, okay. So before that wasn't possible without custom SQL. A bunch of testing changes, which are really good, including uh, randomized testing. That's what I'm a fan of. Uh, All these testing features, I wrote a post explicitly on those. What's another one? Uh, The widget and form uh, rendering is now done through templates. So that should make it pretty easy for you to roll out, roll out a framework like Bootstrap by just dropping a few extra templates in your project. And then you could style every form on your site or every date widget on your site with custom classes or HTML. Nice. That's actually sound really great. Maybe we could dive into the book a little bit and say, I looked at the beginning of it and I was fascinated because you use this term Kaizen, which I've learned about in a couple other kind of business settings. Maybe you can explain why you mentioned that and put it in the top of your book. Yeah, I guess it's something that just resonates with me. Kaizen is a Japanese name for continually improving a process. So it comes out of things like the Toyota manufacturing line where they started doing the first just-in-time production. And every manager at Toyota, for whatever part of the assembly line they're in charge of, they have to make two improvements every fortnight or something like that. So they're always looking for the next thing that could save a few seconds, reduce risk of injury, save costs, etc. And that's kind of what I see DX as like, we can always improve the way our projects work for us so that we make fewer mistakes in the future, deliver features quicker, reduce the amount of typing needed to get something out, etc. Yeah, I I've mentioned in the past that I worked as a trainer at, at Apple, and then I was a consultant on a lot of um, music studios and individuals who wanted to just get to writing music and creating music and wanted to have the technology, you know, have them help them set them up and so forth. So I would have this process where I would watch the person work for a little bit. I, they would say a lot of times they would say just sick, fix it for them. And I'd say, well, show me what you're trying to do right now and and let me just watch for a little bit. And it might be as simple as like in the case of when I was working at Apple, the person is using one of these brand new laptops at the time. They came out with that all single surface uh, <laughs> trackpad, uh-huh. which no longer had a button that was dedicated at the bottom. And I would watch people because it was maybe the first time they've used a computer that was like that. And they would try to drag something and they would hold their finger down and try to drag it and then try to switch to another finger. <laughs> and so <laughs> I would like see these kind of processes. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to kill them if they keep trying to do it this way. And I'd say, oh, you, you know, you can use your thumb and just like hold the button down and then use your finger to move like it used to be. That's not obvious, you know, <laughs> but it's hidden right there. Yeah. And so I, I think of those kinds of things or, you know, I would watch somebody work with a piece of music equipment and say, okay, this, you're creating too much gain at the beginning of this whole chain of things. And that's why you're having problems with feedback and all these other kinds of things and ways to kind of simplify. And you've been a consultant for a while. Is that a process that you go through with, with your clients? Yeah. I'd say it's something very similar. And it's also something kind of apply to myself, I guess. There's I think with DX, there's always this step of like watching yourself do something and then be like, okay, what was the hard bit here? Because software is infinitely malleable, there is always the option to go and change what the tools are doing for you. Yeah. So yeah, uh, often I'm dropping into client projects and they've they've all been doing a certain thing, a certain way for a long time. I'm like, hmm, there there is a better way. Um, (laughs) Here, it's you know, this tool over here that perhaps you haven't heard of or this feature in Django or Python that perhaps you haven't seen before. Yeah. And that can save quite a lot. How much would you say it kind of leans? Is it pretty even, like your own experiences that are in this book versus like things that you've seen out as a consultant? I guess it's the sum of of putting things together 
over many years, seeing a bunch of projects. I estimate I've probably seen like about a hundred production Django projects at this point. Yeah. From just looking over someone's shoulder or at a conference or diving in for a few weeks at a client. Yeah. So it's just like I've I've seen all of the possible Python linters out there <laughs> um, yeah. in some form or another. And you know, Flake is the one I go for, things like that. When you've seen a lot of these other developer experiences. Were there common themes that you would see that were kind of directions that were like, like, okay, I, I see an easy improvement like right away with somebody. Was Were there really common themes? I'd definitely say there's a the trifecta of black, eyesort, and flake eight that is applicable to nearly every project. Yeah, people spend a lot of time in code review, com- you know, changing formatting if there isn't an auto formatter. Yeah. I think a lot of people are using black now, so that's much less of a problem in the ecosystem. But Along with a code formatter and getting that to be less of a back and forth discussion point, letting it decide that stuff. Mm -hmm. The other tools you mentioned, iSort? iSort is an import sorter, so it's a similar code formatter, but it, it, it just bunches your imports in a way that makes them easy to read. Yeah, always a win when lots of people are editing files and imports can end up all over the place. And then you're like, I don't even know if, you know, os.path is imported here. And you want to be able to scan the top of the file easily. And then Flake 8 plus maybe a bunch of plugins. That's a linter. It can check for common issues. Sometimes I drop into a new project and that would be the first thing I add. And after, a, you know, running it across the whole code base, I found some floor that's actually one of their main bugs in production and it just could have been stopped earlier if they'd been running the lint yeah can we go back to the isort for a second oh yeah sure that's you know as someone who's played inside of django and built a handful of different projects and followed you know a, a real mix of tutorials the imports that you do within Django, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then along with you know the standard ones that might be part of like you mentioned, OS and and things like that. And then you're also importing stuff that's within the project. Is there a defined specific order that that it follows, that that program uses there? Yeah, the default for iSort is to group them standard library, third-party packages, your own project. Okay. And that's actually one of the key things it does for your comprehensibility. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's always kind of funny how kind of complicated that all can look. Mm-hmm. Does it also do like sort of an alphabetizing them also, or does it do some other kind of planning within it, or is it just a set order? Yeah, it, it groups them and then alphabetizes them within the groups. Um, and it has a lot of options, which I think is a bit of a shame because black it, black strength is that it has no options. Yeah. But there is a there is a black profile for iSort. So if you just get iSort and then use its black profile and don't touch anything else, you're pretty much golden. All right. And then all that can kind of, across the board, it starts to look the same uh, for all the yep. you know, users and so forth. How, is, how do the developers you're talking to within an organization that you're consulting for, how do they take that advice? Normally pretty well. I think many people just, if they've not seen these tools before, They've seen the problem and they're just like, well, I don't have the energy to manually sort my imports or right. check all the string formatting. And and so when there's all these things that computers can do for us, it's always a bit magical, a great time saver. <laughs> <laughs> so usually pretty positive. Yeah. Scout is an industry leader in application performance monitoring. This low overhead tool is designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues with a super intuitive UI and tracing logic that ties bottlenecks to specific lines of code. You can quickly pinpoint and resolve problems before they reach your customers. Scout's unlimited seats and applications allow your whole team to use Scout without the headache of additional costs. See why software engineers worldwide call Scout their best friend with a free 14-day trial. No credit card needed. Learn more at scoutapm.com. That's scoutapm.com. 
Are there other areas that you have found that have a, a big impact um, to developer experience? Uh, some other general area? The, the first chapter of features in the book is about documentation. And I find just getting faster at looking at the docs is, is one of the things that can smooth out writing new code quite a lot. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that because mm -hmm. you mentioned a handful of different ways to to kind of get to the documentation kind of quickly. And you mentioned this, I'm not sure what to call it. I, I want to call it a tool of dev docs, but it, is it's sort of a site also, like a website that you can go to. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit about what, and it's spelled D-E-V-D-O-C-S, dev docs. Yeah, maybe you can kind of explain like, you know, maybe how you found it, but also like what it does. Yeah, sure. It's a website or like a web app that works offline and holds docs and gives you very fast search over them because they're all local. So you can grab the Python docs, the Django docs, the Flask, Ginger docs, and, and other things like HTML, JavaScript, all in there. And then you can search and, you know, it updates every letter you type. It's searching and showing you the results and it's just it just smooths over the process so much. I see a lot of developers who are used to like going through Google, and then they have to pick out where's the Python dot org result page. Sometimes, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they know what they're looking for, but they still have to spend quite a lot of time figuring out how to get there. And I was impressed with it. Yep. Yeah, with the the versions that it has all the you know like for Django, it you know it has two, three, you know, all the different sub-releases in there, and even four. And the, the, the idea that you can kind of go through them. And then one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that it, you could download this so that you could have it offline. Yeah. And in fact, it's just a, a couple of button clicks away. It's one of the few, like, offline first web apps that I actually use and that uses all the browser features. Very impressive um, and all community-built. Yeah, super cool. Yeah. What I was wondering about with the search functionality, can you specify what it's searching within? Yeah, you can search across all your docs, which is sometimes useful. But more often, I'm like searching within the Django docs uh, or the Python docs. And you can filter just by typing like DJ tab, and then you'll get to filtering within the Django docs only. Nice. For example. Yeah, that's that sounds really, really powerful. And then... You mentioned another tool for potentially offline stuff, and we talked about this a little bit before we started, how there are lots of developers worldwide that may, well, number one, you may be traveling <laughs> and you may not have internet mm -hmm. or, you know, that are in other you know countries or other places where internet connections are not always great or they only have them for a little while. Maybe they meet up at like a school or something like that, and then they go home and, and they don't have it at home. And so the idea of having the documentation with you on the computer, because, you know, as you're developing, you don't necessarily need an internet connection to be coding. But for a lot of us, <laughs> you need some kind of reference materials. And so you mentioned not only DevDocs, but a tool called WGET that I hadn't used before, but I'd, I've heard of where you can use it to download like an entire website or, or portion of a site. How's that work? Yeah, WGET is like the GNU cousin of Curl, which many developers have used. Okay. But it's really focused on mass downloading from a web server. And there's a recipe which I've used when I needed it over the years that I've, I've put in the book that yeah you can find online too for downloading a whole site under a sub-prefix, fixing up all the you know, static asset references like CSS and JavaScript, so they work relative to the local copy. And then you can just open that in your web browser and browse that, browse that site offline. Very useful if you're following a tutorial like the Django Ghost tutorial or some other informal documentation that perhaps you can't find through some a tool like DevDocs. And one of the tricks that you sh show in the book is that if it's maybe a little bit of a fancier site that isn't going to just hop from like one HTML element to another that you can have it hosted using Python's built-in web server? Yeah, that's a pretty neat little hack. Yeah, like the Django Go site uses JavaScript for its navigation between pages, which speeds them up 
on, a, on an internet connection because it does partial page loads, I think. But locally, that feature won't work if you just open the HTML file in the browser because browsers don't allow all web features to work when it's a file URL. But Python allows you to just serve files in a folder up on, on a local port with python-m HTTP.server. Uh, yeah, that was really cool. You just got to make sure your terminal is starting at the right place, right? That you're in the right, yeah. appropriate directory. That's really nice. You know, again, kind of on the documentation side, I'm a fan of DuckDuckGo, and it sounds like you are too, based on what you were writing about it in, in, the, mm-hmm. in the book. And what I was a fan of originally was I was working for a law firm. We talked about this concept of filter bubbles, and that's one of the premises that DuckDuckGo you know, wants to say is that they aren't really gathering information about you and trying to hone in on like what your experience is. So like potentially on Google, if you're logged in, you type a search and I type a search, we may get completely different results, even though we're kind of trying to look for the same thing. And I always thought that was kind of interesting in, inside of that. But even after that idea of it not necessarily filtering it down is this idea they have this thing called bangs or the exclamation point and then like a couple letters. And then I, I've used something similar, like kind of doing like a sort of Google foo of like, okay, you can use a, a colon, like site colon, and then real Python and then your search term after it. But that's a lot to type and, and this is <laughs> way quicker. Mm-hmm. Like if you wanted to search the Python documents, uh, your documentation, you could just do what's colon py right and then type what you're looking for yeah exclamation mark py and then type say http.server and you'll go straight to the python search page no intermediary duck duck go page yeah it saves you a few seconds each time you do it but that, those seconds really could add up to maybe hours in a week right <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally and the idea that you you could kind of quickly narrow the search across like three or four sites that that you trust instead of just leaving it open is kind of neat. So you can do the same for the Django docs also. Or Stack Overflow. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. So it's like what DJ, uh, what's the Stack Overflow one, SO? SO, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyway, so I'll include links for that stuff. And it's, again, <laughs> hopefully going to save you some effort and some time. Definitely a, a nice tool that's in there. When you think about the the concept of developer experience and, and someone coming to this book, do you have a like an intended you know developer or audience in mind when you wrote the book? I definitely wanted to make it accessible to everyone, no matter the level. So that's why for some things like dev docs that, that are right at the start, I explain it with screenshots and, and walk you through the steps of running it. I think it's pretty useful for someone who's maybe new to coding to see that how you actually do this but then it does it does ramp up in levels there's definitely some stuff that you will only understand if you've been coding for a while but hopefully it's something people can come back to and implement one technical tool at a time and be like oh now my experience is a little bit better what's the next thing is that is that how you see someone using it yeah yeah hopefully it's kind of like just a you know biting off a little bit at a time yes. <laughs> <laughs> instead of trying to devour the entire book. Yeah. So I had a, like, a, there's a couple areas that, that I wanted to kind of get into. One is this has been a pain point for, for me as sort of an intermediate dev. I've again, done a handful of different Django tutorials and done some kind of basic cloud hosting stuff on like Heroku or the Google cloud. And one of the areas that I had trouble with, and and I think a lot of these beginner or even intermediate tutorials have a hard time focusing on, is the idea of like the environment files, and and the idea of moving from like a locally hosted to you know a cloud hosted. I feel like that's definitely one of the pain points that that I've felt. And does the book kind of gets into that stuff, right? Uh, yeah, I do explain how you can use uh, environment variables. I think there is a bit of a a gap there because there can be like so much that you can explain in general. Here's how you might do this when you deploy. And then you pick a deployment platform, like you say, Heroku or Google Cloud Run or whatever. Yeah. And then they have to explain, here's how you can set environment variables or secrets or whatever they do. And often there isn't like a, a 
Google Cloud Run exactly how to do it with Django or a general Django tutorial that you can go and go, okay, I'll do this on Google Cloud Run. There's this kind of gap. Yeah, because it's you're you're saying that you know where that information can be sort of held and and sort of set up safely <laughs> yeah. and securely is different depending on the platform. Exactly. Like Heroku's environment variable management is very good. I would trust that. But if you just go put environment variables on a file on a disk on a VPS, then they're sitting there for other processes on your computer to read. So that's a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like hundreds of different options out there these days, like small tools that people have built that encrypt environment variables or, or, or other secrets. Yeah, you just have to figure one out that works. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the problem I, I think that the book could kind of get into that you eventually need to sort of pick as you go deeper and deeper into someone's developer experience and, and you start then saying, okay, well, all right, we're doing this specific tool. You you start to get crowded in that direction and headed down that path. <laughs> yeah. And you can't really turn around. Yeah, very, very hard to write something that hopefully applies to most developers for most of the content. Yeah. And yet still, if they're picking Google Cloud Run or Amazon Web Services App Runner or something that's a bit more niche, they, they can find something in it. Yeah. So did you make it a goal then to tried to keep things as generalized as you could? Yeah, I, I definitely cut out of scope things like deployment, text editors. That's another one where there's so much on developer experience. But <laughs> <laughs> I can't list 20 plugins for 20 editors. <laughs> right, yeah. And then you also you know, avoid the whole like potential flaming war that that could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you mentioned on another show that you were on recently, and I'll include links to the two recent podcast interviews that you did, mm -hmm. uh, but you were talking about, it was on your in Django chat conversation, uh -huh. that you were trying to fill in some gaps between some of the books that are out there. And is that how you feel like this specific book kind of came into being? Yeah, I think a lot of books will talk you through how to build a certain thing, a certain way. And there's not much material out there just on like, what are the things people are using day to day? Yeah. And like, I see this when I, I go to different clients, like maybe they've heard of tools X and Y, but they've never heard of Z or never seen it applied, or they don't know where to start because it's docs are maybe quite in depth. And it always requires, you know, this little bit of starter knowledge, like where's the best place to look to start with this thing. So I kind of try to, put as much of this starter knowledge into into the book, fill in those gaps that stuff that would otherwise just be exchanged over occasional messages and chats at the pub and things like that. <laughs> right. In between conference talks or something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see other gaps? Like what other gaps exist in let's you know, let's focus on the the Django area. Yeah, there's I guess like many technical topics, a bit of a dearth of kind of intermediate advanced material. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it, it's a bit like the, here's a, here's how to do a couple of circles and then here's Instagram. So draw the rest of the owl. Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It gets a little fuzzy in the yeah. middle there. <laughs> there's many, many topics I'd like to write about things like database constraints and advanced migrations and, security headers where Django has all these features and they're documented in a reference style, but there's not really the energy to add loads of extra docs on how to do certain tasks with them, like setting up content security policy. That's a header for security that takes a lot of effort and iteration to do, but can really improve your site security. That needs, that needs you know, 20 plus pages to describe the basic process. So. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. This one is also about Django development. It's titled Django View Authorization, Restricting Access. The course is based on a RealPython article by previous guest Christopher Trudeau. And in the course, instructor Darren Jones shows you how to authenticate and authorize users, use HTTP request and HTTP request.user objects, differentiate between regular staff and admin users, Secure a view using the at login required decorator. 
restrict a view to different roles within the at user passes test decorator, and how to use the Django message framework to notify your users. I think it's a worthwhile investment of your time to learn how to properly configure authorization for your Django projects. And like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all Real Python courses have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. I feel like you're doing quite a bit of that in between your your couple book projects that you've done already with with the blog. Is that how you see the your, your writings on the blog? Yeah, I mean, I like to write also to teach myself because if I'm focusing on a specific topic, I try and find, you know, the right way to do it rather than just something that works. I always find it's a great way of focusing my thinking. And like I'd encourage everyone else to try blogging as well. There's literally infinite things to write about. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. As an example. Yeah, that's always been a problem with me. (laughs) I I, I love so many different things that I I still need to maybe probably focus on one for a blog. Otherwise, I'm going to, like people are like, I don't want to know about, you know, this. (laughs) So, Yeah. What have been your topics lately? Yeah, I was going to say, I wrote a post on fav icons, which is, you know, the little thing that appears at the top of the tab in the browser. Yeah. Seems completely innocent. Every website sets it up. But as I started reading and researching and trying to figure out, okay, what is, what is the best way to do that in, you know, 2022, where browsers are at, where devices are at? Do I need any HTML markup? What file format should I use? And, you know, the post ended up being 3,000 words with all the different <laughs> wow. options. <laughs> I didn't dive into that one yet, but I was thinking about it because they're one of my favorite sort of web features. You know, if you're somebody who's really into tabs, <laughs> yep. you know, you end up seeing them everywhere. And even like there was like a whole kind of weird thing with mobile or you know, there was a whole different ways that it could be showing up there or potentially turning on, like how you can turn a, a website into just like a, a tap, yep. an icon on your home screen or something like that. And so th- there's a lot of that in there as far as like <laughs> keeping it standardized. What was some of the stuff you learned? Yeah, these vendor-specific icons for all the mobile things, you know, Apple, Android, and Windows desktop even, there's a lot of different options there. And there's a lot of, you know, contradicting recommendations on which of those are the best to set up. And I think obviously uh, depends on who's visiting your site. Um, but yeah, like if you only care about browsers, you can keep it really simple with just like a PNG served at favicon.ico. If you, if you want to improve your developer experience a bit, you might have a different icon in your development environment. And then if you want to go the whole hog, then I found one generator called Real Favicon Generator that has been maintained for like a decade, nearly updated for the standards as they've evolved. So, oh, nice. The author there has like you you put you put in your icon, and then it will show you. Here's what it'll look like if you pin it on a on your home screen on Apple, and then you can customize it, and then you can download back the bunch of files you need. Yeah, that's cool. It, it makes me think of um, I worked in a marketing department, and there were these tools that would do the same thing as far as like if you're going to make up a an email Mm -hmm. you know and the idea that it would have html and css and all that stuff in it and you're like okay well what's it going to look like in 12 different (laughs) environments and browsers and phones and whatever yeah that's cool you've also written a lot about types recently Mm -hmm. type hinting and, and things like that and i always find it as an interesting kind of jumping off point for a podcast topic um types in general are not they're a contentious <laughs> subject <laughs> among Python people. I, I say there's like allergic reactions that can happen the minute you mention them. But as someone, and I, I got this just kind of listening to you talk about it a little bit and then, you know, kind of looking at some of the, the writings that you've done, that if you are trying to share your code or, again, work with different companies or organizations or standardize things, I feel like that's where your code needs to maybe start thinking about this interoperability. And also you mentioned earlier about like databases, you know, (laughs) Um, databases are pretty particular about types, especially standard like SQL style ones. Like where do you see your your writing kind of going? And do you you see like a book coming (laughs) out of this and and type checking? You're not the first to ask that. 
I really wrote like each post on a different typing feature to try and you know cement the ideas in my own mind and provide a little reference that's a bit easier than than a pep or the the Python reference docs. I don't know if I'll write a book. I, I think it, it hopefully the post servers. You know, if you go and Google or DuckDuckGo, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, how do I do a decorator in Python? Then you've got my post as a, hopefully a starting point. Yeah, I, um, I hope it helps type spread a bit. Yeah, they're definitely not for every project, but I see a lot of companies trying to add them now. And they're quite keen to get that extra level of protection. That kind of brings up two things. Mm-hmm. One is what types of projects are are adding them, and then how are ways that it's providing protection for them? Yeah, I think companies that have a medium-sized code base plus in Django are often thinking about it. There's this kind of extra cost, like as your code base increases in size, it becomes yeah. non-linearly hard to add them because you know, some function is called more and more times and you don't know the types going through it. So you can invest a bit early and, and get better results. And is especially useful in places where you're doing calculation and you want to, say, avoid floating point. Right. I'm working with a new financial client. They want to use decimal for everything. Right. It makes a lot of sense. They've got some pipe hints, and and that's flushed out a few bugs already. Where you know some function said it would return a decimal, but thanks to the division operator and a floating point variable coming in from over there, it's actually returning a float. And if you add up enough floats, then the error could result in in a few cents going missing, and then that causes an accounting nightmare. So. Right, Superman three or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> I guess that's one of the <laughs> concepts there. Of uh, yeah, floating points are are dangerous for for financial stuff. <laughs> yeah, what do you think the path is f- for Python and, and and types? Like, I'm not trying to make you have to give like a pronouncement <laughs> <laughs> one way or the other, you know. But I know that there are people that say, and Guido himself says that Python itself will always be a dynamic language. To me, and where I stand on it, is as I think about code that's going to interoperate with other code, or potentially you're going to put it out there in open source, that's really those times when you start to think about it. But I guess the other area is you know, not sharing just in an open sense, but could be in a closed sense within an organization that as your code gets bigger, well, you already said it gets harder to add it after the fact that kind of starting early with it can help. Like what are the areas that it helps also? Like I think documentation as one of the things that it can really help where people can really just look at the code and get an idea of like what it's supposed to do once they get kind of the general gist of what type hinting can do for them. Yeah, the the docs case or for making it easy for others to plug into your code is is really key. Yeah. Um, I've added type hints to all my open source projects. And I think that helps, especially because they pop up in the editor these days on VS Code, especially that's just built in. So if someone imports your function and hovers over it, they're going to see this thing. You should feed it an int. And if they do something else, then um, yeah, the default type checker there, PyLance, is going to say, hey, did you mean to do this? (laughs) Right. So even if you're not writing the hints in your own code, then by putting them in a library, it, it really makes it useful for others. I don't know where we'll end up. I think probably popular open source packages will have type hints. People can use them as little or as much as they like in their project code. If I'm going to write a new script, I'm still not going to write type hints if it's a you know, hundred line tool for myself. Right. Not worth it. But when it's something that I want to last longer, that's where I'll use type hints. So do you, as something in your mind graduates to that and you say, okay, this, this personal tool, I'm thinking other people could use this. Is that the moment you start to say, okay, all right, I, I maybe need to go ahead and add this stuff to it. Yeah. I've got all kinds of scripts and tools that I'll use on a one-off basis of my own personal needs. But if I'm going to publish it on PyPy, then I'm going to add type hints. That's my cutoff these days. Yeah. So <laughs> speaking of all those projects that, that we kind of touched on there. What are some of the the recent projects that that you've been working on? Yeah, sure. One of the cool ones that I'm very proud of that I developed during writing the book is called Django Browser Reload. 
you might gather from the name, it reloads your browser <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when you change something in your Django code or when you change one of your external templates or static files. I've seen a bunch of different approaches to this over the years, but as I was trying to write a book section on it, I was like looking at the tools again and being like, none of these are really as simple and general purpose as I'd like to see. Yeah. So I gave it a shot and cracked open the MDN JavaScript section. And with like 120 lines of JavaScript, I've got something that is pretty efficient and reloads when you hit save on Django. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. Yeah, that's cool. Like, I, I really see that as a useful tool as you're, you know, building up a large project <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to not have to constantly, you know, hit run server. <laughs> Are there other mod projects that you want to mention? The other one I'd, I'd mention there would be Django Upgrade. Uh, you might have seen the tool called Py Upgrade that upgrades your Python syntax to newer versions, so it can yeah it can rewrite your type hints to the latest versions or change your format strings to use f strings. Similarly, I wanted a tool that would do this for Django code uh, because something changes in every Django release. There was a tool called Django Code Mod. The only problem with this is it's pretty slow because it was using a, tool, a, a backing library called libcst. So I tried to adopt the technique from PyUpgrade where it only uses the built-in AST and tokenizer from Python, which rule in C and very fast. Okay. And yeah, it's turned out very well. So it can rewrite, you know, maybe 30 or 40 different things that might change between Django versions. So hopefully it reduces the friction of upgrading. Yeah, that sounds really useful. Again, with the slightly faster schedule, it, it seems faster to me uh, watching the, the change numbers, but maybe just the numbering has <laughs> <laughs> yeah. been, been part of the change, but yeah. So one of the things I always wonder about, and we, we talked about it too, about there's lots of resources for beginners. Maybe it's just the the polls tutorial that's on you know the Django project homepage that people can get started with, or maybe the Django Girls blog, or several of the things that we have on Real Python. I feel like sometimes it, it's like, okay, well, where, where do I go next if I want to try to do more intermediate stuff or more advanced stuff? Do you have suggestions for places people could look for that stuff? Uh, yeah, there's the Django newsletter that's every week, and they have a mix of levels of blog posts. And of course, you can go read the archives. So there's always something interesting in there. Okay. Some of the Django YouTubers and Python YouTubers are putting out content that's a bit more advanced. But yeah, there is is maybe a bit of a gap for, like, here's how you use Django with this perhaps slightly more advanced feature or library. Kind of going back to developer experience stuff, mm -hmm. what would be your methodology to try to find something like that? Where would you go first? And would there be specific resources that you would use in a certain order as you start to look for that information or learn how to do something more like that? I guess I get a lot from Twitter. I just try and follow some interesting people who are maybe you're going to know about tools before I do and then tweet about them. Okay. You're pretty active on Twitter. Yeah. How are you using it? I've actually asked a couple people recently <laughs> about this stuff and I was talking to Brett Cannon and he was using it to do like little polls, you know, to kind of ask, mm -hmm. like get general sentiment on stuff. Like how are you using Twitter? Yeah, I did do a, a few polls and like uh, previews of the book material that helped me focus it down on things that people were interested in and add stuff that perhaps I hadn't thought about. I guess I read quite a lot trying to see what's happening. Developers like Brett do put out great posts as well. Yeah. And also just posting Wordle results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to be interesting with the New York Times purchasing them, what that's going to mean for the future. <laughs> so... So many purchases lately. <laughs> it's hard to keep track of it being a being a person into games. <laughs> In your experience consulting, are there really common questions that you get from, say, a, a company or an individual that you feel like you've answered multiple times and added it to the book? If the when I do get these kind of questions, 
I find that there isn't an existing blog post or something I can point at. I'll normally write a blog post. Okay. And then, yeah, some, uh, compile them into a book as well. Uh, like so, some of the sections in the new book are posts that I've written in the past, expanded and turned into something that's a bit more coherent. Yeah. So I have these weekly questions I like to ask everybody. And the first one is, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python? Could be a conference, a project, or package, or a book. I'm very excited for DjangoCon Europe, which will be in September. And uh, they've announced that it'll be in person in in Porto. It's been virtually in Porto for the last two years. Yeah, yeah. I had them on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome that they're going to get to do an in-person one. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, and my partner's Portuguese, so I'm, I'm going to the Lisbon area quite often. And I've, I've always wanted to return to Porto after we went there for a short trip. So super excited to go there. I got very excited about, about maybe going because <laughs> <laughs> it just looks so beautiful from all the stuff that they were sharing. So that's great. So that's uh, they're the same two individuals hosting it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. What would you like to learn next? What's something you're interested in learning? I'm into music and drum and bass and music production. I used to produce quite a lot in university when when I was in the music tech society there. Yeah. And I guess it's taken a bit of a sideline, but for Christmas, my partner bought me the Ableton hardware device called the Ableton Push. Yeah, okay. And that's exciting for me for music production. It's it's a device you can hook to your laptop and then not look at your laptop screen. You can control the whole music production process with the hardware device. So that will hopefully uh, give me a bit of a screen break whilst I can still make some music in the evenings. Yeah, triggering loops and, and you can use it to control like write patterns and other things too, right? Oh yeah, it's so advanced. Um, they've got like <laughs> a library of ha videos on how to do things. And they teach you like 50 things in three minutes and I have to watch them about 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I've been playing around with CircuitPython and I've got a prototype of a foot pedal. Oh, cool. And I was using it to do keyboard commands uh, initially. Like I was using it like a, a trainer kind of thing, like you're talking about watching those videos where you could hit pause or rewind 10 seconds or fast forward 10 seconds and kind of like control that with your feet because maybe a guitar or something else is in your hands, right? Mm -hmm. And then I've gone a little further because I wanted to maybe have it like fire off clips in something like Ableton. <laughs> Again, using my feet <laughs> to like start recording or, you know, set up the next loop or whatever. So yeah, cool. Do you have um, any shout outs or call to action you want to share? None other than the obvious, buy my book. <laughs> yeah, check it out. <laughs> so where is Boost Your Django DX available? It's on Gumroad, um, and there's a link from my site, adamj.eu. Okay, we'll include that stuff in the show notes also. Mm -hmm. And then do you have any other like ways that you'd like people to connect with you online? Sh sure, follow me on Twitter or say hello over email. i um, very happy to receive stories about use of Django or Python or anything that I have uh, written about. As I'm sure you're aware, you know, you can write something on the internet and maybe you get back negative comments <laughs> or you don't get much at all. Uh, just a few <laughs> likes. You know, it's always nice to hear someone just sending a sentence. Or two. <laughs> Why is the internet <laughs> returning null? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's nice to get some kind of reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been really fun to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me. And don't forget, learn why Scout APM is the developer's best friend by visiting scoutapm.com. I want to thank Adam Johnson for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs>